Hey, thanks, Kevin. Hey, good morning, everybody. Open up your Bibles, 2 Samuel 24. It's the last chapter of 2 Samuel. If you need one, raise your hand nice and high, and we've got some young men that'll bring those by to you. Um, we do have a couple chapters remaining. We remember those two we skipped. We, we haven't forgotten. We haven't taken them out of the Bible or anything like that. Uh, we'll get back to those at some point, hopefully, Lord willing, before my, uh, my transplant as we're in the midst there. Hey, before we get into the, the word this morning, just a couple prayers. I want to share a couple updates. Uh, you guys uh, know our, our little buddy, our good buddy, Oakley, Oakley Fugit. And I know Oakley's watching right now from the hospital. So uh, we're going we're gonna to shout out to Oakley here in a second. Oakley had a, a pretty significant surgery uh, on uh, on Friday and uh, Oakley did fantastic he made it through that so well he is uh, he's recovering now he'll be in the hospital a few days I was able to talk to him yesterday and uh, I said hey buddy what do you want me to what do you want me to say to the people and he said pastor John can you please tell everybody thank you for praying for me and so thank you guys for praying for Oakley what is Oakley 14 I believe Oakley's 14 years old loves the Lord and uh, and, and he said read him Psalm 46 that's what he told me so, hey, Oakley, I'm going to read him Psalm 46, okay? Not the whole thing. Uh, I mean, I could, but I won't. But I'll just read some of it. Listen to this. And this is Oakley's special chapter. This is my special chapter, too. And, uh, and so God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. We put our trust in the Lord. And that's what Oakley's done. And so I don't know if you guys on the cameras, I didn't privy you guys to this, but if you could go to the wide angle, uh, I want you guys to say, we love you, Oakley. Can we do that on, on three? Oakley, this is for you, buddy. I hope you hear it. One, two, three. We love you, Oakley. All right. That's your family, buddy. We love you. We miss you. And for Dave and Crystal, mom and dad, pray for them too, you know. But it's, it's so good to be on the other side of that, uh, that major surgery. So we look forward to seeing him and having him back with us. Uh, just loving Jesus and, and, and keeping us young. I love that. So, uh, Father, we thank you for Oakley, Lord. And in Jesus' name, pray that you would just continue to, uh, God, pour your spirit into him, to heal him, to comfort him. Lord, may you flood him with your peace right now, God. Lord, I know he, he, he was nervous last week, and now he's on the other side. Thank you, Jesus. And, Lord, you just continue to minister to him and to mom and dad, Lord, and hold them in the palm of your hand, as we'll talk about this morning, God. They just, I know he trusts his life to you. So continue to show him more and more of yourself and continue to settle him into your perfect, loving, incredible will. Lord, we, we praise you for him. Thank you for getting him through this. Continue to walk him through his healing, Lord. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We love you, Oakley, buddy. Uh, secondly, this morning, um, uh, Glenn, I didn't get your permission, sir, so I hope you're okay with this. Glenn's, uh, Glenn Ritchie's mom passed away this weekend. And it, I know you, um, many of you have been praying for her for a number of months. It's been a, an arduous journey. Um, but so we just want to pray for Glenn. I just want to lift you. We want to lift you guys up right now. Uh, so um, if you guys, you'll forgive me later. If you, I'm sorry, brother. I love you. Uh, if anybody feels led to just go over near Glenn, we're going to just pray for him, pray for his family now, because I know he's, uh, he's a tough guy, but uh, this is hard. And so um, just want to lift him up and, uh, and his family, Jen and, and Kyle, this morning. And... Um, Father, we, we come before you, Lord. You know the prayers of the last 11 months, Lord. God, you know the cries of the hearts of family members for Glenn's mom. Lord, you're sovereign God, and we, we lay our prayers at your feet. We cry out to you, and we lay our, what we, how we beseech you. And, and Lord, in all of that, we, we put at your feet, and we trust to your sovereignty. And Lord, I just pray now for, for Glenn and for Jen and Kyle, Lord, and the family, Lord, and and God, just all of the sentences that, that aren't finished and all the thoughts that are swirling through their minds, Lord, and for the process of grieving and the, and the joys and the angers and frustrations and all the emotions that go with that, Father, in the name of Jesus, you would just wrap them in your arms, Lord, and walk them through these days ahead. God, may they hold one another up. May they lean on one another. May they lean on this body, this family around them that loves them so much, Lord. Um, God, we just thank you for the, the freedom and the, and the opportunity that we have to cry out to you in these times of need. And Lord, we sing it. We don't know what you're doing sometimes, but we know what you've done. And so, Lord, may Glenn and Jen and Kyle just lean on what they do know. Lord, that's so sure and secure. 
and entrust their thoughts and their emotions and the, and the days ahead into your able hands. Father, just minister to them, and then we ask this, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We are family, and, and uh, we're just privileged to cry out to the Lord for one another. Guys, last week in chapter 23, David penned his last words. It was a short psalm. It was a prophetic message of the coming of the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. If you didn't catch it, go back and read at least the first seven or eight verses of that chapter. And then we read about and learned some lessons from David's mighty men. Uh, I was talking with Gary this morning, man. We could have spent a Sunday on each one of those men, I know. But, uh, but uh, we move on. Uh, 2 Samuel ends, chapter 24. A little bit of a low point at the beginning of this chapter. David uh ohs again. You know, the greatest man in the Old Testament, kind of in a way. You know, we, the last chapter of this, of the annals of this book, he, he, he does a knucklehead move. But it's redeemed at the end. And so we'll see what happens in his heart. A question for us this morning is where are we placing our trust? Who are you trusting in? What are you trusting in? And I hope we walk away with a firm answer on that uh, this morning after having walked through this chapter. Uh, I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to read the whole chapter, uh, and then we'll comment on it as we work our way through this. So follow along with me, 2 Samuel chapter 24, uh, the entirety, beginning with verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. So the king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the number of the people. But Joab said to the king, May the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times as many as they are, while the eyes of my lord the king still see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? But the king's words prevailed against Joab, and the commanders of the army. So Joab and the commanders of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan and began from Aurora and from the city that is in the middle of the valley toward Gad and on to Jazer. And they came to Gilead and to Kadesh, the land of the Hittites. And they came to Dan and from Dan they went around to Sidon and came to the fortress of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and Canaanites. And they went out to the Negev of Judah of Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. And Joab gave the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. In Israel, there were 800,000 valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were 500,000. Verse 10. But David's heart struck him after he had numbered the people. And David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now, O Lord, please take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. And when David arose in the morning, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say to David, Thus says the Lord, Three things I offer him. Shall three years of famine come to you in your land? Or you, will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to him who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But let me not fall into the hand of man. So the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning until the appointed time. And there died of the people from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men. And when the angel stretched out his sword, his hand, excuse me, toward Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord relented from the calamity and said to the angel who was working destruction among the people, It is enough, now stay your hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. And Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. 
So David went up at Gad's word, and the Lord command, as the Lord commanded. And when Aruna looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Aruna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be averted from the people. Then Aruna said to David, oh, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Here are the oxen for the burnt offering and the threshing sledges and the, and the yokes of oxen for the wood. All this, O king, Aruna gives to the king. And Aruna said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. But the king said to Aruna, No, I, but I will buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord responded to the plea for the land and the plague was averted from Israel. So remember, guys, these last few chapters of this book, you know, are an epilogue. We've shared that the last few chapters. The timing is uncertain. Uh, a lot of scholars believe these events may have taken place after David captured Jerusalem, which would have been back in like chapter 5 or so before he brought the ark into the holy city. Not sure, and the when this happened is not terribly important. If it was, the, the Holy Spirit would have told us exactly when it happened, so that's not so extremely important. But whatever had taken place previous to this, we read in the very first verse that the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people of Israel. They had disobeyed God. We do that today. And it, it doesn't please the Lord when we disobey him. So his people had disobeyed him. And it says that he incited David to go and number Israel and Judah. Now, that seems problematic to read that that way. We learn as we read this that what David did was wrong, okay? It was wrong. But would God move David? Would God move us to do something that was wrong? That's a head scratcher, okay? We don't have time for it today, but you can go and read the parallel passage that's found in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, if you want to jot that down. Uh, there's a parallel passage to this in 1 Chronicles. And then in chapter 21, verse 1, it tells us this. It says, Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. Okay. So the question then is, who's doing this? Is, it, is the he here, is it God that's moving, Satan, that's moving David to do this? Or is it Satan that's moving David to do this? And I think in a way, the answer might be, it is both. Now let's qualify that. Directly, it was Satan that moved to do what was wrong. Why? Uh, because God can't be tempted and God does not tempt us. We learn in James chapter 1, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. Okay, so it wasn't God inciting him directly to do something wrong. That would be Satan that was doing that. But listen, God is sovereign. Okay, and in his sovereignty, he does foresee and he does allow things to happen that fold into his bigger plan. Think about it, just as God allowed Satan to test Job. Okay, it was Satan that was doing the, the kicking against Job. It wasn't God directly that was doing that. We know that God can accomplish his purpose through Satan's attacks. Did you catch that? God can accomplish his purpose great purposes through Satan's attacks. So, don't grow weary when the enemy's trying to beat the snot out of you, okay? And I know he does that because he wants to proclaim to you that he will win. God is like, hey, John, chill out. I'm still in control. I get the last word. And, and that's, you know, do you, you see what I'm saying? Remember in, in Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians, he talked about, listen, in 2 Corinthians, it says this, 12, 7, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh a message of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. God's like, go ahead, give the thorn. I'm going to use that for good. You want to take him out? No, I'm going to use it for good. So God is sovereign and he allows these things to happen. So we could dig for days into that. Just wanted to bring that up uh, there. Read that parallel passage. God is sovereign. 
So really it was both God and Satan that were working in this, in this situation. So David sends Joab, the commander of the army, we know Joab, to coordinate this census, the accounting of the people. And it tells us that they counted from Dan to Beersheba. That's Bible from as far north as you can get to as far south as you, as you can get. Now, there seems to be a hint in the wording here. David says in verse 2, that I may know the number of the people. There, there's a little flavor to that, that I may, I want to know. Hmm, okay? David's heart motivation for doing this was not right. Okay? We'll talk about a census here in just a second. We're going to make seven points. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this this morning. Our first point, number one, point of application for us. Before you act or speak, stop and ask why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? If David had done that, if he had spent some time with the Lord and stopped and asked, why am I doing this? Uh, perhaps he would have said, oh yeah, no, this is not a good idea and I'm not going to do this. Have you guys ever done something, wishing you hadn't done it? And then it's like, oh, doggone it. I wish I had asked, why was I doing that before I did that? But I did that. Then it's too late. And then you got to pay the consequences, right? Uh, I think this is a good, a good illustration or a good application for us. Now, a census in itself wasn't wrong. It wasn't wrong necessarily to count the people. In fact, the Old Testament book of Numbers, that's really what that's about. It was, it's about the census. It's about accounting of the people. And in the Bible, in the Old Testament, census, and uh, New Testament for that matter as well, a census would have been taken for one of two reasons. One was to assess for taxes. Remember when, when Mary and Joseph had to go? That was a whole tax thing, okay, and for the census, right? So one was for the taxes, and the second was to assemble an army for war, okay? But neither of these was the case right now in history. That wasn't the case. David was acting what we call in church, David was acting in the flesh. You guys ever heard that phrase, in the flesh? Now, for maybe some of you that are new to church, you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> okay, um, there's the flesh versus the spirit. Okay, the flesh is our carnal, sinful, unregenerated old man, old woman nature, and the spirit, the spirit of the living God who is in us, who now resides in our hearts and lives, who has made us a new creation. There's a war between the two, and, and the point is this: when you get saved, when you're born again, you don't immediately cease to desire sinful things. Any Christians agree with me? You're right. When you get saved, it doesn't mean like all the bad things that you ever did automatically go away. That you don't have a craving or desire to do things that are sinful. You still do. It's a process, okay? Because you've got the old self versus the new self. You've got the old man versus the new man. And you've got to feed your spirit and you've got to starve your flesh. That's what we have to do. It's not like pixie dust falls from the sky and all of a sudden I'm not a sinner anymore. If it only worked that way. I don't say bad things to people who cut me off in traffic anymore. I bless them and don't curse them. Well, we try to, okay? So it's a process, a process of growth. Remember what Jesus told his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's a battle between the spirit and the flesh. Guys, don't think you're bad Christians when you struggle with sin. You're struggling. Dead men don't struggle. You're living. You just got to look, Lord, I need your spirit to fuel me up here. And I've got to say no to these things, right? Okay? And, and if God sets you free, that you don't have those cravings anymore, then praise him on your face. Praise him for that. But if you are wrestling, know that the spirit in you is greater than he that's in the world. Here's what Paul said. Walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. So the question we ask ourselves is, is what, I'm, is what I'm doing and what I'm hearing and what I'm watching and what I'm engaging in, is this walking in the spirit or is this walking in the flesh? You can't have a foot in either. You're all in one or you're all in the other. May we walk in the, the spirit. You remember Paul's dilemma in Romans 7? You guys remember that? For I don't understand my own actions. For what I do not do, for I do not, see I can't even read it. I don't think, he could barely write it. <laughs> You know, he was having issues. For I do not do what I want to do, but I do the very thing I hate. Paul, what's your problem? It's sin. And he goes on to say, who is going to set me free from this mess? The apostle Paul is asking that question. Of course, we can answer the, ask the same question. And he says, thanks be to God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He'll set us free. So anyway, David acted in the flesh. Now Joab respectfully says, man, man, the God would add a hundred times that many to your, to your army, uh, you know, to the people. That'd be great. But Joab noticed in verse three says, why are you doing this? 
Like, why are you doing this? Even Joab, who had, and, and he, Joab, he had done his own share of shenanigans. I mean, Joab wasn't like the poster child for getting it all right, right? But even Joab was like, what, what are you, he was perplexed at David. Why are you doing this? It seemed uncharacteristic of David. Joab's like, this isn't, why are you doing this? Because he knew God had not ordered this census, okay? Guys, listen, when folks who know you begin to question you, you should pay attention. When you have a relationship with somebody, a friend, uh, whoever in your life, a spouse, it doesn't matter, and they're close to you, and they know you, why? What's that? Let's have the microphone. Did I just go out? Are we okay? Um, when they're questioning you, pay, pay attention. It could be a warning. We might be veering into disobedience or hiding. Point number two, depend on friends to check you from time to time. Depend on friends to check you from time to time. And be that kind of friend for other people. Don't, don't be like, well, you know, I mean, you know, I, you know, who am I to question you? It's like we're called by God to do that. You know, if, if, if your brother or sister is, is goofing up, point it out. You know, you know what I mean? Um, I'll just say it because it's my last Sunday. So if you got a booger on your shirt, right, point it out to your friend. Don't let them just, oh, that's kind of embarrassing. I don't want to say anything. You know? No, point it out. Say, hey, look, man, I love you, man. And I know this is weird, but you, you got something on your shirt, you know. And just, you know, I, whatever, okay. We, and, and so Joab is trying to point out to David. David's like having none of it. It says that David prevailed. So Joab and his men went on and did the counting. And they worked from the southeast all the way up by Dan and all the way back down the coast on the western side there. Ended up in Jerusalem in verse 8. It took nine months and 20 days. Um, wow, that's a lot of time for, 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 for this count. And it says that after he had numbered the people in verse 10, after he had numbered the people, Lord, he messed up. And it wasn't until after he had done it that his heart struck him. Side note, Holy Spirit, please pound my heart before I goof up. Convict me before I do something that I shouldn't do. Guys, cry that prayer out to the Lord every day. God, when I put my feet on the floor this morning, I'm, I'm human and I'm probably going to mess this day up one way or another. Can you get in front of me and help me not to say or do something today that's going to smear your name or that's going to hurt a brother or a sister? David did something here heinous. I mean, and we'll talk about it in a second in a little more detail. So when the Lord, when our heart is struck, okay, that's a good thing. Though that's a good thing. Because that indicates that our heart is not hard. And guys, for the believer today, it's an indication that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Listen. The question is, will we listen? Will we comply? Will we be obedient? Or are we going to resist Him? Okay? Point number three. A troubled conscience can be like physical pain, an indication that something is wrong. Now, don't get me wrong. The enemy can pound us too. First John, it says, you know, when our hearts condemn us, there's one who's greater. And we know that. So we got to be careful because there's a, there's a fine line sometimes between condemnation and conviction. If we're having conviction from the Holy Spirit that something is wrong, high five the Holy Spirit and say, thank you for pointing that out in my life. But if the enemy's beating you up and condemning you, that's a totally different narrative. And we have to, we have to uh, place that under the blood of Jesus. But David knew he had done something wrong. And he said, he confessed, I have sinned greatly. Uh, same thing he said, uh, you know, in Psalm 51 when he repented of what he did with, David, with Bathsheba, right? But he says, I have sinned greatly. He didn't try to downplay it. He didn't try to justify it. He acknowledged it. And he acknowledged that it was huge. He says, I have sinned greatly. He confessed. And that word confess just means to agree with. He agreed with God. You know, he agreed with the, the Spirit's conviction. Again, the Holy Spirit didn't live in David. This is before Jesus. But the Holy Spirit was upon him, moving him. And he's like, I agree. I'm wrong. I am wrong. Okay? But it took him almost 10 months to do that. You know? And that should never be. Guys, let's pray to God that we keep a sensitive heart. When we, when we keep a sensitive heart, we pick up on sin quicker in our lives. 
it, it hits our radar a little brighter. You know, sin that simmers leaves a mess in our life. And, and, it, and waiting to deal with it leads to greater issues. It drives a wedge in between our relationship with God. We have to deal with that sin. Remember David's confession uh, in Psalm 32 after the adultery with Bathsheba. He said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Guys, not, I, David, there must, I, I don't know, did it hit him 10 months later just like that? Or was, was the Spirit speaking to him? Guys, listen, in our life, if your heart is heavy because you know you've done something you shouldn't have, deal with it right then and there. Don't wait. Don't wait. Now, David had ordered Joab. He said, count the men so that I may know. Again, I want to know the number of the men. David acknowledged that that was foolish. He, he, he said it. I have acted foolishly. And when you're in the flesh, we do, when I'm in the flesh, I do foolish things. That's what we do. Things that we'll regret. Again, the motive behind what he had done was, was pride. An unhealthy pride. You know, for, for whatever reason, despite everything that God had done in all of David's life, David was putting his trust in the size of his army. Right? Guys, how many of us are tempted to trust in our bank account or to trust in our ability or to trust in our job or to trust in our future plans? Yeah. It's like, oh, I got it. I got it all together. I'm going to plan. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Listen, it can all change in a moment. There's only one who doesn't change. And he's the one we need to be trusting in. I guarantee you everyone in here could share a story of something in your life, in your past, that you have put your faith and trust in or you've strived for, you've gone for, and it changed and it totally deflated you in the moment. And you were left like shell-shocked, like what just happened? Everything I thought I was living for, everything I thought I had, perhaps in a moment, can be taken from you. Guys, that's what happens. That can happen, you know? Psalm 33 says this, The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation, and by its great might it cannot rescue. I would take that verse further and say anything is a false hope for salvation, except for the Lord himself and his truth. Who am I trusting in? What am I putting my trust in to move forward? Where's your trust this morning? I'll tell you this. It was great to talk to my surgeon last week. He gave us 45 minutes of his time. Uh, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> you know? And, I'm, and we're sitting there online watching him and listening to the coordinators talking about what they're going to do to me and all this stuff. And it's like, um, I appreciate having a guy who knows what he's doing. That's great. <laughs> you know? Uh, and hopefully he's not watching any YouTube tutorials right before he does his surgery or anything like that. Right? And um, if he does, I hope he doesn't tell me uh, that he did. Uh, you know, and, and I appreciate having a good staff and a good team of doctors. But listen, guys, I need to get past that and put my trust in Jesus. I'm not saying I don't. I do. I do. I do. Thank you, Jesus, for the great team of doctors. But inevitably, my trust must be in him. Where's your trust this morning? So David cries out to God, says, please take away this iniquity. Take it away. You know, and then God spoke into the situation through the prophet Gad. And he did something unusual here. He offers three choices for punishment. Now, Bible scholars wrangle back and forth on this, on why God did this. And we could wrangle back and forth this morning, and we would be just as successful and fruitful as those scholars are. We wouldn't be. <laughs> They're trying to figure out and pinpoint the mind of God. And, and, but, so instead of doing that, let's just look at what happened. The three choices were either years of famine, months of war or days of pestilence or plague. Those were the three options. Now, the Hebrew rabbis comment on these, and I'll, I'll share their commentary here this morning. The famine. If David had chosen famine, it's possible that because David was the king, he may have been immune to that because he would have had his own stores and he would have been provided for even if everyone else didn't have anything, okay? If he had chosen war, well, we already read back in 2 Samuel chapter 21 where David's a minute, and again, we don't know the timing of all this, so if this happened earlier, you know, again, it, this all depends on the timing of, of these events. But if, it, if this did happen later in his life, uh, his men had said, hey, you can't fight anymore, right? So David wouldn't even have to have gone to battle, but... but 
but even earlier, he could have had his bodyguard around him and may have been protected. So, but if he chose, thirdly, the plague or the pestilence, everybody's equal. Everybody's equal. David as king, he, he wouldn't have been immune uh, to that. No one would have been. So David's response was this. He, he says in verse 14, I, I want to be in the hand of the Lord. He had already repented. He had said he sinned. It, it's kind of like if I had been David and I heard those three choices, I would have been like, I beg your pardon, God. I love you. Can you give me a fourth choice? You know, the, the, these don't sound too, too, too good, you know. But he wanted to be in God's hand. Look, even when I've messed up, God is my shelter. He is my rock. So point number four, point number four, when my sin or the sin of others, for that matter, has caused distress, may I trust God's grace and place myself in his hand. And that's what David was doing. He wasn't trying to figure all this out. He's like, I don't want to be... I don't want to face man. I don't want to face man in war. I'd rather face God. I trust him, so I leave myself in his hand. Now, let me just take a moment here this morning to comment on this because I know you're asking this question, as many do. Many, many have this question. Why in the world was God so harsh killing so many people for David's sin? There's no other instance in the Bible where this many people died in that short amount of time. This is pretty grave. This is, a, this is a big deal, okay? Let's talk about this for just a moment. The census, okay? Going back to the census again, this is all surrounding him um, illegally, if you might say, even immorally, because of his heart motive, counting the people. He was doing it for the wrong reason. He hadn't been asked by God to do this, okay? They, God saw his heart. Census in Scripture, it, it signified, and, and this would have been significantly understood by the, um, the Israelis at the time, the Jews. The census signified ownership, right? And, and, and so think about this. I go home and I count my guitars. They're my, you know, my guitars. Or I count my Andy Griffith Show DVDs. Like, I have this many Andy Griffith, right? Get your hands off my Andy Griffith Show DVDs. I mean, you can borrow them. You better bring them back, though. But he, you see what I'm saying? So it, it signifies ownership, all right? The, Is, the Israelis, the army, if you will, didn't belong to David. They belonged to God. But David, in his pride, was considering these men as mine. And that was dangerous. That was dangerous. Now to drive this home, it's foundational. Listen, God had instructed Moses on the census. I wish we had more time. Go back and read Exodus chapter 30. You'll read all about it. But let me give you this verse. Exodus chapter 30 verse 12. God tells Moses, God instructs Moses, when you take the census of people of Israel, then each shall, off, shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, and there will be no plague among them. So God says, when you do this, Okay, you're counting my people. You make an offering for each one or a tax of sorts, okay? So that there may be no plague among them. That hadn't been done here. Again, an indication that David's heart was not in the right place. Mine, mine, power, okay? Now, listen, don't think for a second that people were innocent. It's very... Very surely the people were culpable in, their, in this whole thing. They were trusting in themselves. They were trusting in their strength. Again, verse 1, remember it says that God's anger was already against Israel. So this is not just about, David, you messed up, therefore all 70,000 died because of you alone. Okay, this is a complicated kind of conflagration here. Really it is. But God had, listen, God had warned the people. Remember when Samuel came on the scene to anoint the king and the people cried out for a king like all the other, all the other nations. God had warned the people against that, okay? Even though David was a man after God's heart, even though he was chosen by God, this whole king thing was still an allowance by God. That was not God's design. God's design was, I am your king. And if you have a man, no matter how good that man is, right? You're going to have problems. And that's what he had promised through the prophet Samuel. You're going to have problems. Even though David was a foreshadowing a picture, a type of Jesus, right? He was human. And, and human kings make mistakes. And sometimes the people pay for the leader's mistakes. That's the way it goes. This is an ugly mess here. But it tells us in verse 16, the Lord relented. 
And I guess David was like, wow, you know, if I had put myself in the hands of man, maybe they wouldn't have relented. But God relented. And David speaks and says, why, why are you punishing these people? David saw himself as the shepherd. And, he's, and, he's, and he looked at the sheep. And, and I can't fathom David's like, they're all innocent. I mean, but he's, he, it's like he was looking at the people as innocent. And he says, why are, you, why are you taking the sheep out for something I did? Now, guys, let's not try to dig into that theologically and come up with a super easy answer because it's not easy. But let's look at it this way. Let's look at David. David, man, he was fessing up here, right? He had failed the sheep. And, and there's a lesson, point five, in this for us, point five. When I mess up, may I not make excuses or shift the blame, but may I own it. May I own it when I mess up. So David met the angel of the Lord. It says by the threshing floor of Aruna. In the midst of death and plague, in the aftermath of the sin, what does God instruct David here at the end of this chapter to do? This is absolutely amazing. This is the part I could spend months on. <laughs> he instructs him to go raise up an altar. What do you do at an altar? You offer sacrifices. You praise God. You offer offerings. You worship. So God instructs David to worship. And, and the location, guys, super significant in Scripture. The threshing floor of Aruna. Now, threshing floors were, were higher elevated hills usually. Do you guys know what a threshing floor is? Don't you guys... Do you guys use threshing floors or do you go to the grocery store and buy your grain? Okay. All right. So a threshing floor elevated. It would catch the breeze. They would take the grain out up to the top of this hill and they would toss it into the air. The chaff would blow away and then the grain, the fruit would fall. For life in that day, this was one of the most significant places on the planet. Because if you didn't eat, you died. Well, the same thing is true today. But they didn't have what we had. So they had to do this the old way, right? Okay? So, what, oh man, I left my pointer. Can you look in my... I, I just got to do one more laser pointer before I'm out for a few weeks. I don't know where it would be in there somewhere. Don't worry about it if it's not there. There's so much stuff in there. I got probably old sandwich and old coffee and stuff in there. So, no, I'm kidding. I don't. There it is. Look at that. We got a pointer here. Just a like, second. I'm a pointer. Don't get old. You forget things. Thank you, buddy. I even wrote a note and forgot it. And so, so in the, do we have, we have two pictures. City number one, if we could look at this. This is what, and so this is what Jerusalem would have looked like in David's time. How do you use this thing? I've used it before right here. There it is. This is the city of David, guys. All right. This is the south side of what today is Jerusalem. Over here, you have the Kidron Valley. See it? Kidron Valley, the Garden of Gethsemane would be about right here. And then this hill, that's, there's nothing here. Don't try to read what's up there, guys. Don't worry about that. Up here would be the Mount of Olives, okay? So you got the old city. Uh, David's palace would have been up here in the corner. Uh, and so there it is. Go to the next picture. This, is, this would be Jerusalem in, in, this, in, the, uh, in the time of Jesus. So the city of David would be like here, Okay. Okay, the western side was added on. You got, you know, Herod's palace would be up here and everything. Uh, down here you have the Pool of Siloam, which would have been right outside the city of David back in the day. Here's the eastern wall. Here's the Kidron Valley down here. Mount of Olives is over here. This is the hill. Now go back to the other picture. Okay, sorry. See this big hill up here? This wasn't in Jerusalem in the day, right, of David. Uh, this is called Mount Moriah. Okay, do you guys, are you guys familiar with the name Mount Moriah? I remember Pastor Mark taught on Mount Moriah years and years before we had children, and we thought our, our firstborn was going to be named Moriah. We were absolutely sure of it. And uh, we ain't naming none of our boys Moriah, but anyway. Um, we never got a girl, so anyway. But um, so this is Mount Moriah, and uh, Mount Moriah in Genesis 22 is where Abraham took Isaac to sacrifice him. Okay, Mount Moriah. Years and years later, this is where Solomon would build the temple. So go to the next picture. Here would be the temple uh, right here, this area. Okay, this is the temple. That was built right up here. Uh, you know, of course, today it's a dome of the rock. Um, and, uh, um, but the hill, 
the scholars are divided, <clears throat> but these hills right here, the hills of Moriah, uh, is right over here is, is a rendering of where Golgotha would be, where Jesus was crucified. May or may not be the actual spot. Point is, in the same general direction, the same general vicinity, is where Jesus would, uh, would, would die on the cross. Interesting. So I just wanted you to see those, those pictures. Mount Moriah, uh, the, the, the threshing floor of Aruna. Um, Genesis 22, Abraham, Isaac, huge stuff. But so Aruna, he's a, he's a Gentile, but he's, he's, he honors David. And he comes and he, and he says, hey, let me hook you up. I'm going to give you the land. I'm going to give you the oxen and everything like that. And, and David is like, huh, uh, uh, nope, it's not going to happen. Not going to happen. Point number six, may we not offer sacrifices that are cheap, but may we feel the cost and be willing to pay it. David's like, I'm offering nothing that doesn't cost me anything. I'm going to pay the price. And he did. He paid for it. I could spend hours on this and, and we won't. Guys, cheap, easy, low commitment worship and serving and giving is, is not worship and serving and giving at all. God told Abraham to sacrifice your son. He was willing to do that. God spared him. Jesus went to the cross and gave everything for us. He didn't, he didn't reserve anything. He gave it all. When we come to the Lord, whether we open the word, whether we're serving in church, whether we're sharing in the community, whatever we do, let's do it wholeheartedly as unto the Lord. I don't want to offer cheap anything to him. I want to give him it all. So the Lord relented. The Lord responded. And I think the lesson we leave ourselves with this morning, point number seven, remember that nothing that matters will be done in our might or power, but by God's spirit and empowerment. So let's trust him. Let's trust him. You know, I, I went back and, and one of my favorite verses is Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. Paul is, is talking about his, his life of ministry and admonishing and teaching the word of God. And, and he says, to this end I, this is the 1984 NIV version. To this end I labor, struggling with all his power or energy that is at work within me. Guys, when we trust the Lord, he gives us his grace. He gives us his power. We don't need a mighty army. We don't, need, we don't need tons of people fighting for us. We don't need technology. We don't need all this stuff. We don't need the savvy. We don't need all of that. If we've got the Lord, God brings us what we need, who we need, when we need it, where we need it. We just have to totally trust him. Easy? Absolutely not. I get it, right? That's our quest. That's our journey. Lord, we want to trust you more and more and more. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. I pray we trust him. Father, thank you this morning for these lessons that we learn uh, in your word. God, may we walk this out. May we trust you with every fiber of our being. May we not look to our, our, our anything, our numbers or our, our neighbors or our, our armies or our, our smarts or our training or our plans. May we look to you. May we live fully for you. God, we love us. Continue to teach us this week, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.